Hi, listeners. Just a quick reminder that starting in August, Cults is moving exclusively to Spotify. Being a part of the Spotify family means that we're able to bring you more in-depth and exciting content than ever before. And we can't wait for you to check it out. Mystery, manipulation, murder. Don't miss any of it. All you have to do is download the Spotify app for free and search Cults. Give it a follow and start enjoying. That's it. We can't thank you enough for listening to Cults. And we look forward to seeing you exclusively on Spotify in August. Due to the graphic nature of this investigation and trial, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes discussions of child sexual assault and murder that some people may find offensive and may be upsetting for some listeners. We advise extreme caution for listeners under 13. If you are aware of a child who is being abused, you can report it to the National Child Abuse Hotline, reachable at 1-800-4-A-CHILD. You can also visit www.childwelfare.gov for state-by-state -state resources for reporting child abuse or neglect. Police entered the building at 761 West Hammond Avenue on March 12, 2004. The small structure was part of a shopping complex, legally designated for use as a business. But a family of more than a dozen had lived there for over a year. The inside was pitch dark and the curtains were drawn. It was completely silent. Officers passed their flashlights over an eerie living room. They saw antique coffins with cushions on top of them like beds. A mountainous heap of canned food was out on a countertop. After police checked the coffins to ensure they were empty, they proceeded to a bedroom. An officer opened the door, shined his light inside, and gasped. He ran inside and fell to his knees in a pool of blood. In front of him, the bodies of nine women and children were stacked on top of each other, all of them shot through the eye. The officer desperately searched for a pulse among the pile, but there were none. Outside, the man who carried out the executions, Marcus Wesson, sat in a squad car. His face showed no flicker of guilt, no trace of regret. To him, it was all an eye for an eye. Hi, I'm Greg Polson. And I'm Vanessa Richardson. And this is Cults, a podcast original. Every Tuesday, we look at a cult's practices, their leader, and their followers. Today, we're continuing our deep dive into Marcus Wesson and his vampire cult. The large incestuous family was started by Wesson in 1974 and believed that Jesus Christ was an immortal vampire. At Parcast, we're grateful for you, our listeners. You allow us to do what we love. Let us know how we're doing. Reach out on Facebook and Instagram at Parcast and Twitter at Parcast Network. And if you enjoyed today's episode, the best way to help us is to leave a five-star review wherever you're listening. It really does help. We also now have merchandise. Head to Parcast.com slash merch for more information. You can listen to previous episodes of Cults, as well as all of Parcast's other shows, on Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts. A new episode comes out every Tuesday. Last week, we examined Marcus Wesson's early upbringing. After growing up in an abusive and strictly religious home, he joined the Army and served in the Vietnam War as a medic. In 1968, he began a relationship with Rosemary Solorio, a married woman who was 13 years his senior. Over the next few years, Marcus took control of Rosemary's household and started abusing her children. In 1974, when he was 27 years old, Marcus left Rosemary and eloped with her 15-year-old daughter, Elizabeth. Over the next 15 years, Elizabeth gave birth to nine children. Marcus took custody of seven more from Elizabeth's relatives. In total, he was in control of 16 children, aged 6 to 17. Marcus physically and sexually abused the children. He also raised them to believe in his unique brand of Christianity, which held that Jesus Christ was a vampire and Marcus was a second God. This week, we'll take a closer look at the increasingly disturbing practices of the Wesson family, 
will examine how Marcus's abuse became more extreme and eventually culminated in the murders of nine young women and children in 2004. In 1990, 44-year-old Marcus Wesson was in the midst of legal trouble. He and his 32-year-old wife, Elizabeth, were under investigation by the state of California for welfare fraud. The Wessons, along with their 16 children, had so far avoided punishment by keeping the family moving. They stayed at a rented campground in the mountains near Santa Cruz as often as possible. But they couldn't camp permanently. The site had no running water or electricity. The family moved back and forth to Santa Cruz for supplies every few weeks. Their nomadic lifestyle had already foiled attempts by Child Protective Services to investigate the home. But it looked like Marcus's luck was finally running out. When he tried to buy a small boat with his welfare checks and sign his friend's name to the paperwork, authorities noticed. In late 1990, Marcus faced charges for welfare fraud. Before the trial, he drastically altered his appearance. He cut off the dreadlocks that extended to his lower back, shaved his beard, and ditched his tattered brown cloak in favor of clean suits. By all accounts, he was unrecognizable. He went from eccentric drifter to the epitome of respectability overnight. Outwardly, he was well-spoken and clean-cut, while at home, he screamed and sermonized to his family about Jesus Christ's vampiric nature. Marcus was a social chameleon, able to change his behavior to adapt to whatever social situation he found himself in. Vanessa is going to take over on the psychology here and throughout the episode. Please note, Vanessa is not a licensed psychologist or psychiatrist, but she has done a lot of research for this show. Thanks, Greg. Professor Dr. Ronald Riggio distinguished between two qualities of social chameleons, self-mentoring and social control. He wrote, self-mentoring is the ability to read social cues, to try and fit in to a specific social situation. Persons high on social control are also able to control their impressions, but they're not as highly affected by the social situation. Marcus definitely didn't usually try to fit in. He prided himself on having views that were at odds with what he saw as a corrupt society. However, those with high social control tend to stand out in a positive manner, which Marcus definitely did not. Many times he went out of his way to make others uncomfortable as a way of manipulating or upsetting them. Exactly. Dr. Riggio continued, Individuals who possess a great deal of social control are more likely to be perceived as potential leaders. The downside of too much social control, however, can be a sort of arrogance born of the supreme self-confidence that the individual possesses. Marcus considered himself a second god, and obviously smarter than his lawyer. Against his attorney's advice, Marcus calmly argued during proceedings that his boat was his family's home, and thus it was legal to purchase it with benefit money. But investigators knew it was impossible for Marcus, Elizabeth, and their 16 children to all live on the small boat. They discovered the Santa Cruz campground where they really stayed. Despite his efforts, the case was too clear-cut for Marcus to manipulate in his favor. It only took one afternoon of deliberation for the jury to convict him of felony welfare fraud and perjury. Marcus was sentenced to three months in prison and five years of probation. After he was incarcerated, he continued to try every trick he could to get around the law. He sent pleading letters to the judge, asking his sentence to be commuted. He filed motions contending that his public defender had committed a crime by failing to file the numerous pretrial motions Marcus had requested. These motions and appeals also went nowhere. Marcus was forced to face the reality that he couldn't influence the legal system the same way he was used to manipulating those around him. He was released in early 1991 after serving his full three months. Marcus returned to his wife and 16 children more frustrated with society than ever. He adopted a new philosophy for dealing with the government. From then on, he refused to sign any documents including birth certificates for his children. 
Marcus documented his new philosophy in one of the many handwritten treatises he used to educate his children. He wrote, A man is within the jurisdiction of equity, ethics, and legality when he takes advantage of loopholes in the law for the betterment of his family. Marcus felt he hadn't done anything wrong by attempting to exploit the welfare system, and yet he was prosecuted anyway. His incarceration convinced him he needed to keep his family even further segregated from the corruption and heresy of society. He wanted to someday keep his family in total seclusion up in the mountains. But Marcus had bigger problems to deal with first. He struggled just to keep his large family fed. Before his arrest, he used welfare checks to pay rent on the campground each month. After he was convicted of fraud, he no longer had any money coming in. Luckily, his eldest son, Dorian, turned 18 in 1992 and was eligible for his own benefits. Marcus ordered him to file for welfare as soon as possible. The checks were passed on to Marcus, who used them to slowly improve the campsite. Marcus's desire for isolation coincided with an increasing sexual perversion. After he returned from prison, the sexual abuse of his biological and adopted daughters was more aggressive. Starting when the girls were as young as seven or eight years old, he abused them multiple times each week. In his twisted reasoning, by molesting the girls, he was teaching them how to please a man and preparing them for marriage. He avoided intercourse until the girls were 17, but his younger daughters were still made to perform other sexual acts on him and each other. While Marcus abused the girls, their mother, Elizabeth, turned a blind eye. By a tacit agreement with Marcus, she ensured she never participated in the molestation. But she was aware of it and walked in on the act several times over the years. A long, private talk with her husband always followed these incidents, but she never stopped him. Elizabeth was in a deep state of denial. According to a study by Christine Adams published in the Yale Law and Policy Review, denial is a psychologically incapacitating state that some mothers experience when faced with the possibility that their children are being sexually abused. Denial can hinder a mother's capacity to acknowledge that such abuse is occurring. Even in the face of direct evidence, Elizabeth clung to her denial as a way of shielding herself from the consequences of her husband's actions. This was likely due to the fact that she was also abused by Marcus as a young girl. Adam's study stated that for mothers who were victims of abuse themselves, strategies that they developed to contend with their own abuse may inhibit their ability to confront their children's abuse. It may also be difficult for these women to accept the fact that they permitted their daughters to be victims of the same abuse to which they had been subjected. The continuing abuse can lead to a vicious cycle. When victims don't receive support, they're not able to deal with their trauma. Liba Spring, a sexual health educator for Toronto Public Health, stated, It's a direct line from one abuse to another. Kids who are sexually abused, if they don't disclose and they don't get counseling, they become re-victimized because they live with the mentality of, I am worthless, I am garbage. The abuse made Marcus's wife, daughters, and nieces defenseless against his manipulations. He made them feel completely powerless over their bodies and minds. Marcus took advantage of the girls' increasing vulnerability as they aged. In 1993, his eldest niece, Sophina, was 17. That same year, Marcus was inspired to intensify his sexual abuse by David Koresh and the Branch Davidians. Koresh's standoff with the Waco, Texas police was given wide media coverage for over a month. On April 19, 1993, the 51-day standoff at Mount Carmel ended in the deaths of 76 people. A quarter of them were children. Most who saw the event on the news watched in horror. 47-year-old Marcus Wesson watched in awe. He gathered his entire family to watch the standoff live. The children were excited as they were not usually allowed to watch TV. Marcus told them David Koresh was a godly man and that the government shouldn't be interfering with his family. Marcus claimed he wanted to have a large family like those in Waco. 
He told his daughters it was a shame their mother Elizabeth was past the age where she could bear children. At the time, Elizabeth was 33. She was definitely not menopausal, but she had not given birth in seven years after having nine kids between the ages of 15 to 26. It's possible Marcus was using a contraceptive or that they weren't having intercourse now that she was over 30. Marcus gathered all the girls in the household, except for his wife, in a room. The nine girls ranged in age from 7 to 17. Five of them were his biological daughters. The other four were his nieces. Marcus told the girls that men like David Koresh had large families because they wanted to lead as many children as possible to heaven. Marcus wanted to have more babies so he could lead them all to paradise. If Elizabeth could no longer have his children, his daughters and nieces would have to be her surrogates. It took some convincing, but convincing was Marcus's specialty. He knew that putting all the girls on the spot at once like this, especially the younger ones, would help his case. The pressure of a group can be a powerful, persuasive tool. As Professor Dr. Arthur Dobrin wrote, Group pressure is enormously effective in producing social conformity, and nowhere is the pressure to conform stronger than in small, close-knit groups. Fitting in feels good, and we pay an emotional price for the courage of our convictions. One by one, the girls agreed to help Marcus expand the family. They had been raised, many of them since they were infants, to believe he was a second god, and thus infallible. Most didn't understand what they were truly agreeing to. Coming up, Marcus talks to his wife about impregnating their daughters. Every so often, something so impactful happens, it has the power to capture the attention of a whole country. An event so deadly or dumbfounding, it has no choice but to live on in infamy. Hi, Parcasters. It's Ashley Flowers, and I'm exposing the most sinister cases from the darkest corners of the globe in my new true crime limited series, International Infamy. Every Tuesday, come along as I guide you on a wicked world tour. 15 different countries, 15 infamous crimes. Take a trip to Iceland where six people confessed to a murder that never actually happened. Journey to Mexico where a Lucha Libre wrestler moonlights as a serial killer. And travel to New Zealand where two friends hatch a deadly plan to become famous. Each episode of International Infamy explores the twists and turns of a notoriously high-profile case, zeroing in on the cultural details which make the crime unique to its location, and explaining why it couldn't have happened anywhere else. Follow my new Spotify original from ParCast, International Infamy with Ashley Flowers, and catch a new episode every week. Listen free on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Now back to the story. In April of 1993, 47-year-old Marcus Wesson was inspired by the leader of the Branch Davidians, David Koresh, to grow his cultic family. He took his young daughters aside and manipulated them into agreeing to bear his children. After all the girls agreed to do what he asked, Marcus took them to see his wife, Elizabeth. He told her about his new plan and claimed all the girls wanted to have his children. Elizabeth Wesson was taken off guard. She asked the girls if that was really what they wanted. They all nodded enthusiastically, none grasping the significance. It made Elizabeth uncomfortable. This seemed too far, even for the man she had spent 24 years obeying unquestionably. She told Marcus they would need to talk about it later. After some long, closed-door conversations, Elizabeth agreed to her husband's request, but she stipulated that the girls should be at least 18. Marcus negotiated her down to 17 and a half, but agreed to wait a couple of years to begin the process. In the meantime, he focused on his long-term project of making the mountain campground permanently habitable. In 1995, at the age of 49, he finally succeeded. The land now resembled an army encampment, 
Marcus and the children installed a long green tent with bunk beds for all the children. They had a 5,000-gallon septic tank and a makeshift outhouse. For drinking water, they filled up dozens of gallon jugs on rare trips into Santa Cruz. There was still no electricity. It was here, in the total seclusion of the campsite, that Marcus married the first of his daughters and nieces. One at a time, he took his niece Sophina, now age 20, her half-sister Ruby, 18, and his own daughter, Kiani, also 18, to a quiet area. He had them all place their hands on the Bible and swear their faithfulness to him. Then he gave them all rings. Marcus finally achieved his lifelong dream of having multiple wives. He was ecstatic. Within months, all three of Marcus's new wives became pregnant. He kept the fact that he was having intercourse with the girls as quiet as possible. He told his sons, nephews, and, and anyone else who asked that the girls were artificially inseminated. They were not. They were also without medical care during their pregnancies. Kiani didn't see a doctor until two weeks before her due date in late 1995. The following year, Sophina and Ruby had their children. On the birth certificates, the woman marked the father as unknown at Marcus's direction. The women were all overjoyed to have babies of their own, but the new mouths to feed were a financial strain for the family. The other children had to stop showering to conserve water. There was no gas money to get down to Santa Cruz and restock. Morning after morning, the family cooked oatmeal and thin soup, sometimes on a space heater when propane was scarce. Things were tough. One of Marcus's nieces, 26-year-old Brandy, was starting to get fed up. Brandy was older than many of the girls and frequently got into confrontations with Marcus. He failed to recognize that she had a minor learning disability as a child and abused her when she didn't learn as fast as the other girls. Their relationship was strained at best. Even still, after the first babies were born, Brandy knew Marcus would move on to her soon. It sickened her. She woke up early one morning and ran away as far as she could. After hours, she made it to a major road and hitchhiked to Santa Cruz. She called her mother, Elizabeth's sister, Rosemary. Rosemary had long struggled with drug addiction and left her children with Marcus almost 10 years prior. She was not pleased to hear from her daughter. At first, she told Brandy to go back to Marcus. But after Brandy tearfully begged her for help, Rosemary reluctantly came to pick her up. Back at the campsite, Marcus blamed himself. He believed Brandy left because she was jealous of the other girls. According to him, she wanted a baby, and he hadn't given her one. A few days later, Rosemary got into contact with the Wessons and told them Brandy was safe with her. In light of their severe financial troubles and their history of conflict, Marcus decided not to try and get Brandy back. She was the first to escape the cult. The family's problems were just beginning. In 1997, they were evicted once again. The owner of the campsite Marcus had been renting passed away. His son inherited the land and kicked the Wessons out. With money tighter than ever before, and a growing family, now of 20, 51-year-old Marcus decided someone needed to get a job. Someone who was not him. He agreed to let his eldest sons 24-year-old Dorian and 23-year-old Adrian move out. The men were told to find work and send money back to Marcus for the first two years they lived on their own. Dorian and Adrian were handed a pass to escape the family and were never required to come back. This lightened the load for the family and created some cash flow, but it wasn't enough. Marcus told his three younger wives, along with his 19-year-old daughter, Sabrina, that they would need to find work, too. In search of jobs, Marcus moved the rest of the family back to Fresno, where their extended family lived in a duplex. The Wessons took over the second floor of the house. At least seven of the children slept together in the living room, shoulder to shoulder. The four oldest women were hired at a nearby McDonald's. Marcus drove them to work every morning and collected their paychecks. 
they were under strict orders to do their work as quietly as possible and return home directly afterwards. Thanks to their quiet industriousness, Ruby and Kiani were trained to be managers within months. Once money started coming in, Marcus made his first big purchase. He found nine old coffins from an antique shop and decided he had to have them. For $400 a piece, he bought the coffins and lugged them up to the duplex. He told the shop owner he was planning to use the finished wood on the coffins to renovate some boats, but they were never put to that purpose. Instead, they were used as beds for the youngest children. Perhaps at Elizabeth's insistence, rather than sleeping inside the coffins, the children slept on top of them. A cloth was placed on top to protect the wood, and a cushion was stacked on top of that. Later, the Wesson children reported that the use of the coffins as beds was treated as a joke in the household. No one outside the family seemed to get the joke. While Marcus spent his children's hard-earned money, he continued to chastise their behavior at work. He warned the women to avoid talking to their co-workers, especially other men. He began beating his wives more often because he constantly suspected them of talking to men outside the family. But even his non-stop fear-mongering couldn't prevent his children from experiencing the outside world. 20-year-old Ruby was friendly with her co-workers and wasn't scared by Marcus's lies. It didn't take long for her to realize that there was a chance for life outside the family. In late 1997, she decided to explore those possibilities. She planned to run away, just like Brandy had, but her only chance would be to leave work early. That meant leaving her one-year-old daughter, Aviv, behind. She agonized over the decision, but ultimately decided she had to take the opportunity. She left work early with her co-worker, Emma. That night, she stayed at Emma's house. Elizabeth Wesson found her the following day. She begged Ruby to have a talk with Marcus in his van. Ruby refused at first, but Elizabeth's tearful pleas wore her down. She climbed inside Marcus's van, just for a talk. Without saying anything, Elizabeth slammed the door behind her. Marcus peeled out of the driveway and sped home, completely silent. Once they arrived at the duplex, Marcus dragged Ruby upstairs to a bedroom. He kept her locked in there with him for 12 hours demanding she promise never to leave again. When she refused, he punched her on the top of the head, where it wouldn't leave a mark. Ruby told Marcus she wanted to get married and have a family of her own. He told her she was already married. Marcus didn't let up. By the next morning, she was beaten down. She quit the job at McDonald's and started working at another restaurant in the next town over. Her escape had failed. But things were far from back to normal. Marcus knew Ruby had a taste of reality, and she would be punished for it. He beat her every night for ten days. By the end, her welts were so painful, she couldn't sit or sleep. Marcus decided that time in the city had corrupted his wives. Now that he had the money, he revisited an old plan to live offshore. He traveled to Marshall, California, about 200 miles away from Fresno, and bought a tugboat named the Sedan. The boat was old, decrepit, and inoperable. It was anchored in the Tamales Bay permanently, but it was large enough to accommodate the whole family. In spring of 1998, he had everyone still living with the family quit their fast food jobs and move up to Marshall with him. There was little time to get settled in. Marcus still needed to make payments on the boat. He arranged for six of the younger women in the family, along with at least one of his older sons, to get jobs at the conference center in town. Like Marcus, Elizabeth was always exempted from regular work. Every morning at 5 a.m., the Wesson children rowed to shore in a dinghy. Marcus sat at the back of the boat and never rowed himself. The boys emptied the day's toilet waste into porta potties near the harbor, while the women started the half mile hike to work. The women worked 10 hour shifts in the conference center's kitchen. To keep his wives' eyes from wandering, Marcus hosted girl talks every week. 
During the talks, he instructed his daughters and nieces on the tenets of womanhood. He also probed them for details about their work to ensure no one was violating his rules by fraternizing with men. Tattling was encouraged. If one of them was found guilty, he hit or spanked them, usually as long as it took to make them cry. After he stopped, he made them kiss him. The women were regularly called into Marcus's private quarters at the back of the boat to be sexually assaulted. He played the women off of each other so that most of them didn't realize their sisters were also being molested. According to Sophina, quote, each one of us had a totally different life with him. He knew each girl individually. Some were stronger than others. Some were weaker in some ways. That's how he worked. Marcus had manipulated every person in his family from the time they were small. This made it easier to exploit their trust in him. Still, it took a ruthless and calculating hand to keep 18 children largely under control and at his service. One of his most powerful tools of control was shame. As therapist Dr. Eric Maisel pointed out, this is indicative of an exploitative, authoritarian personality. He explained, to dominate is not enough. The authoritarian wants you harmed and diminished. Since nothing feels quite as bad as shame, it is shame especially that the authoritarian wants you to feel. Religious study was an important feature of the family's life and the main way Marcus elevated himself to shame his children. On the Sudan, Marcus began working on his magnum opus, entitled, In the Night of the Light for the Dark. It was a mishmash of autobiography, spiritual treatise, and free verse poetry. Eventually, it would balloon to over 1,000 pages, all composed on an old typewriter. As part of his evolving doctrine, Marcus gave the children vampire names. Marcus, the lord of the vampires, was called G. Vam Mark Suspire, a combination of his name along with Jesus and vampire. Some names for his children were Jiva, Tala, Shidani, and Kina. Marcus would later say his teachings were meant to be taken metaphorically, and he did not claim to be an actual vampire. But to his children at the time, his meaning was never quite clear. Whether Marcus claimed to be actually undead or just a spiritual vampire, as he later said, it had a marked effect on his children. It's how they understood their roles in the household. As the head vampire, Marcus's duty was to protect the family, and his family was there to serve him. Coming up, some of Marcus's wives break free of his control. Now, the conclusion to our story. By the middle of 1998, the Wesson family of 20 had been living on a tugboat named the Sudan for the better part of a year. 52-year-old Marcus Wesson continued to rule the family with an iron fist. He sexually and physically abused his children, especially his three young wives. But some were starting to get fed up with doing his bidding. Nobody was more fed up than 21-year-old Ruby. Her first escape attempt had been foiled the year before, but she hadn't given up hope of leaving the family. One day, while the rest of the family was out, Ruby realized she was the only person aboard the Sudan. She hated to leave her daughter behind, but she knew she wouldn't get another opportunity like this. She rode the dinghy to shore and hitchhiked to a bus station. She tried to get a ticket but had no money to her name. Withholding financial resources is a common tactic of abusers and a major reason why some victims of abuse stay in the relationship. As therapist Michael Formica wrote, Abuse is about a dynamic of extremes, domination and submission. It is about giving and withholding also in the extreme. Luckily, a woman noticed Ruby crying and allowed her to stay the night at her apartment. The next day, with the woman's help, Ruby took the bus to Fresno to stay with friends. Unfortunately, after a few days with them, her lack of funds forced her to go to her mother, Rosemary's house. This time, she was ready to confess everything. Ruby told Rosemary that Marcus was her baby's father and that he was beating her regularly. 
Rosemary was unmoved. She told her daughter that she made the choice to marry Marcus as a 17-year-old, and she would have to live with the consequences. Ruby could see there was no reasoning with her mother. She left and found refuge at her half-brother's. She wasn't there for long before Elizabeth showed up to convince her to meet up with Marcus once again. With her second escape plan failing, Ruby wondered if she was doomed to be trapped in the family for the rest of her life. While Marcus and Elizabeth chased after Ruby, a crisis unfolded aboard the sedan. Sophina and some of the older boys were left in charge while the family heads were away. Almost as soon as Marcus was gone, they spotted some suspicious white vans on the shore. Marcus had long warned the children that agents of the government would someday arrive to break up the family. Sophina watched two vans with the word progressive written on the sides drive in circles again and again. She worried that today was the day. Sophina did as she was taught. She gathered the children in a circle below deck and retrieved a 22 caliber pistol from its hiding place under the floorboards. Marcus had instructed his eldest children to carry out a murder-suicide pact in the event the authorities closed in on the family. Sophina calmly loaded the gun while the rest of the children held hands and prayed. Soon they would go to meet the Lord and leave behind only Marcus, Elizabeth, and Ruby to tell the world what happened. But after the gun was loaded, Sophina found she couldn't go through with it, especially not without Marcus's explicit orders. Some of the older boys volunteered to row ashore and find a phone to give him a call. After a tense half hour, the boys returned with news. Marcus told them to stop what they were doing. Those vans were not some secret government agency. It wasn't time to carry out the murder pact. Not yet. Back in Fresno, Elizabeth showed up at her son's house and found Ruby. She once again begged Ruby to meet with Marcus and talk out the situation. Ruby wasn't interested, but Elizabeth was tireless. She insisted Marcus would be reasonable this time. Ruby finally agreed to meet him at a Denny's, but only to say goodbye. At first, Marcus tried to wear her down like before, he subjected her to a four-hour session of insults, accusations, and manipulation. But Ruby held firm, and eventually, Marcus left. He returned the next day, this time with four children, including Ruby's two-year-old daughter, Aviv. He left them with Ruby, and she cared for the children at her mother's house. Without Marcus breathing down her neck, she found purpose in raising the kids. Just as she was forging a new bond with them, Marcus returned at the end of three weeks. He told her the Lord had called on her to raise the children. She couldn't abandon them now. Ruby thought hard about what she had been through over the past decade with Marcus. She ultimately couldn't bear the thought of leaving her daughter alone with him, and Marcus wouldn't allow her to take the baby on her own. Once again, Ruby agreed to stay with the family, for the second time, Marcus had bent her to his will. She felt more helpless than ever before. Ruby wasn't the only one looking for a way out in 1998. Sophina, now 24, fell in love with a co-worker at the conference center where she worked. A few months after the near murder-suicide attempt, Sophina told Marcus she kissed the man and wanted to move out. He was enraged. By the time Marcus was done screaming at Sophina, the sun had long gone down. Unlike Ruby, Sophina hadn't bowed to his demands or insults. She still wanted to leave. Marcus finally agreed to take her to her aunt's house in San Jose. In the dead of night, Marcus and Sophina took the small rowboat to shore and climbed in the family van. Sophina did her best to stay strong. She knew she wasn't out of the woods yet, and Marcus was subject to sudden temper tantrums. On the way to San Jose, Marcus accused her of leading on multiple men at her workplace, committing adultery and a hundred other sins. Her repeated denials made him angrier and more reckless. 
After half an hour, Marcus suddenly slammed on the brakes and made a U-turn. As Sophina started to cry, Marcus told her she would never leave. The expression on his face chilled Sophina to her core. By the time they arrived back at the bay, Marcus's anger was gone. He was dead calm. He asked Sophina if she loved the Lord, and then, without warning, he stabbed Sophina with a knife in the upper chest. She passed out. A few minutes later, she came to. Marcus was watching her from the driver's seat, unblinking. He asked her if she wanted to go meet God. Sophina was confused and in pain, but was coherent enough to tell him no. As the realization of what just happened set in, she started to panic. She begged Marcus not to kill her. He, too, started to panic. He cried and apologized. He claimed he thought she was ready to die. He said he was sorry and made her promise to never tell anyone what had just happened. Sophina groggily agreed to whatever Marcus asked. He carried her back to the rowboat. A few days later, Sophina recovered. She was once again trapped on the Sudan. Marcus ordered the other girls to give her the cold shoulder, and she was left more alone than ever before. The next year, in 1999, the family was evicted from the boat. Apparently, leaving a broken boat permanently anchored in the bay was illegal. Once again, the Wessons migrated to Fresno to live in the duplex with their extended family. After the move, Ruby was once again determined to escape. Before, she had come back to the family for the sake of her daughter, three-year-old Aviv. Now, she decided that she couldn't take the suffering anymore and resolved to leave with or without her child. She fell in love with a co-worker at the fast food restaurant where she worked and eloped with him. After a few weeks, she called Elizabeth to let her know she was okay. Marcus got on the phone and demanded she come home. This time, Ruby had the support of her new husband and refused to be bullied. She told Marcus she was never coming back and hung up the phone. With Ruby gone for good, the family fell into an uncomfortable calm. Sophina, however, continued to receive the silent treatment for two more years until 2001. By that point, she was depressed and suicidal. Her only comfort was an older man named Milton, who she met while working at a hotel. Milton could see that she was troubled and worked hard to get her to open up. Her sisters tattled to Marcus that Sophina was speaking to another man. Marcus beat her viciously. She continued seeing Milton anyway, and after a few months again told Marcus she wanted to leave the family. Marcus could see Sophina was willing to do whatever it took to leave. He felt her negative attitude was impacting the other girls anyway, and so decided to grant her some independence with conditions. Sophina agreed to send him her full paycheck for the next two years and live with her mother. After a few months, however, she became pregnant with Milton's child. She was afraid to tell Marcus, but knew he would find out anyway when she started to show. She decided to confess to him the next day. To her surprise, Marcus wasn't upset. He hugged Safina and asked if he could keep the child. When she told him no, he sent her away. It was the freedom she'd been dreaming of, but she knew it meant leaving her five-year-old son Jonathan behind. Leaving him was the hardest decision she ever made. Marcus was now down to only two wives, Elizabeth and their daughter Kiani. He soon replaced Ruby and Sophina with his 20-year-old niece, Rosa, and 23-year-old daughter, Sabrina. By 2003, both of these women had given birth to Marcus's children, bringing the family total back to 20. That year, Marcus decided to move to find living arrangements for the new babies. Using money siphoned from the paychecks of his grown children, Marcus bought a small building in Fresno he signed the deed under Elizabeth's name as part of his aversion to signing documents himself. He had a good reason to fear legal repercussions. 
The building was supposed to be a business and was not zoned for residential use. The Wessons moved in secretly under the cover of night. As always, the youngest children were kept in the house at all hours, except under special circumstances. People who lived in the neighborhood nearby were aware of some of the Wessons in the small building, but no one had any idea there were seven small children, too. The family managed to stay in the building for about a year before the city caught wind of their illegal habitation. In March of 2004, the Wessons received an eviction notice. Marcus made yet another plan to move his family to an undisclosed location. No one was surprised by the eviction notice. By now, the family was used to moving around. Sophina, though, was distressed. Her eight-year-old son, Jonathan, still lived with the family. Elizabeth told her about the eviction notice, but refused to tell Sophina where the family was going next. Sophina didn't want to lose contact with Jonathan. She decided if she was ever going to get him back, she had to act fast. She contacted Ruby, who, unlike Sophina, had cut herself off from the family completely. Ruby's own daughter, seven-year-old Aviv, was also being held captive by Marcus. Ruby agreed now was the time to take their children back. Otherwise, Marcus could leave with them for good. Ruby and Safina reached out to the parts of their extended family that knew about Marcus's abuses. They had to be careful about who they talked to. But they knew many family members who hated Marcus and would be their allies. With the help of their uncles, aunts, and cousins, they planned to show up at the house and demand Marcus turn over their children. If he refused, the men would distract him while Ruby and Sophina ran in the house to grab the kids. They made their move on March 12, 2004. Some of the Wessons, including Elizabeth and the older men, were out of the house at the time, but Marcus was there. Sophina arrived first and was led into the house without a problem. She often came to deliver groceries or give money and see her son. She tried to retrieve Jonathan, but was stopped by two of Marcus's wives, Kiani and Rosa. They began arguing inside the house. Marcus stepped outside and saw the rest of the family there, ready to pounce. Marcus was completely calm, despite being outnumbered. He asked the mob to leave. They refused. Police were called after Kiani and Rosa attacked Sofina. They chanted Judas at Safina and Ruby and demanded they bow at Marcus's feet. When police arrived, Marcus continued to act calmly and tried to charm the officers. He wanted to appear to be the only reasonable person in the situation. His strategy was described by psychologist Dr. Lauren Soero as a key tactic of manipulative people. He wrote, Manipulators also refocus the point of an argument in ways that favor themselves. Manipulators are projecting their own concerns onto the world, finding evidence in it to support their preconceptions. Marcus tried to control the narrative by repeatedly stating that Ruby and Safina were no longer the children's mothers. They'd surrendered their parental rights to him when they left the family. He left out the parts where they were physically and emotionally threatened and coerced into doing so. For once, Marcus didn't quite get his way. Sophina and Ruby showed the birth certificates for the children to the officers. The forms showed only their names, not Marcus's. In response, they told Marcus to bring the children outside. He changed his tactic and refused outright. He wouldn't let them enter the house without a warrant and demanded they call the sergeant. While additional officers and Child Protective Services were on their way, the pandemonium escalated. Marcus's elder sons and Elizabeth arrived back home and joined in the chaos. The arguing and threats were out of hand. In the confusion, Marcus slipped around to the back of the house with two of his daughters and went inside. Sophina and Ruby alerted officers but Marcus had already been gone for a few minutes by the time they noticed. It was too late. They heard muffled gunshots over the shouting. Elizabeth stepped inside the house and flew out screaming a moment later. She ran into Sophina's arms and whispered, They're all gone. Sophina and Ruby broke down crying. 
police yelled for Marcus to come out with his hands up. When Marcus emerged, he was soaked in blood and wore a completely neutral expression. He didn't resist when the officers patted him down and pushed him into the squad car. Nobody was prepared for the grisly scene inside. Officers entered, passed by the antique coffins in the living room, and made their way to the back bedroom. There it was, a pile of bodies ringed by a rancid pool of blood. At the top of the pile was Marcus's wife and daughter, 25-year-old Sabrina. Below her was 18-year-old Lise, another of Marcus's daughters. The youngest victim, one-year-old baby Jiva, the daughter of Marcus and Kiani, was third in the pile. All of them had been shot in the eye. The pile kept going. There were two 18-month-old children, Sedona and Marshy. Then, four-year-old Ethan. Next, there was eight-year-old Illabel, named after Marcus's one-time mistress. Lastly, there were Sophina and Ruby's seven-year-olds, Jonathan and Aviv. An ambulance was called, but there was no saving the children. In total, nine were killed that day. The Wesson family was shattered. A year later, on June 17, 2005, Marcus was found guilty of all nine murders, as well as 14 charges related to sexual abuse. He was sentenced to death. Elizabeth was given immunity for her complicity in exchange for her cooperation during the investigation. Today, though many of the children are gone, the legacy of Marcus Wesson lives on. Elizabeth and a few of his children are still in contact with him while he serves his sentence at the San Quentin Prison in California. His sentence was commuted from death to life without parole after a moratorium was placed on executions in the state. The rest of his family has done their best to forge lives in a world they were raised to be afraid of. The remaining younger children were cared for by Elizabeth's relatives. The older children went through counseling and have done their best to adapt to a new way of life. They all still remember that day in March and the punishment they suffered at Marcus's hands. Thanks again for tuning in to Cults. We'll be back with another episode next Tuesday. You can find more episodes of Cults, as well as all of ParCast's other shows on Spotify or your favorite podcast directory. Several of you have asked how to help us. If you enjoy the show, the best way to help is to leave a five-star review. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at ParCast and Twitter at ParCast Network. We'll see you next time. Cults was created by Max Cutler, is a production of Cutler Media, and is part of the ParCast Network. It is produced by Max and Ron Cutler, sound designed by Andy Waits, with production assistance by Ron Shapiro and Paul Mahler. Additional production assistance by Maggie Admire and Freddie Beckley. This episode of Cults was written by Terrell Wells and stars Greg Polson and Vanessa Richardson. Hi, listeners. It's Ashley Flowers, and here's a quick reminder to check out my new true crime limited series, International Infamy. Every Tuesday, I'm taking you across the globe to look at 15 of the most notorious crimes from 15 different countries. Some stories are sure to shock, some may leave you stumped, but all are quite the trip. Follow my new series, International Infamy with Ashley Flowers. Listen for free on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts.